All right, everyone. Good evening. NXT Vengeance Day is in the books. We just got finished watching it on Peacock, streaming the WWE Network. Welcome to our Combat One Wrestling Podcast, our second episode, back by popular demand. I am your host, Lord Cephas. I am joined by the real hero, the standard bearer, our head of the table, the Earl of Florida. Earl, how are you doing this evening? Oh, I'm sorry. I was talking to the Brom Breaker fans out there. I'm doing pretty good. It was, uh, I enjoyed the pay-per-view, so I can have nothing to complain about. So let's get right into it. What we'd like to do is when we do these is kind of give the people who only get to listen to a few minutes of what we do kind of an idea of if it's something they should invest their time in to watch the event, maybe on replay when they have the opportunity. Earl, sounds like you would recommend it for anybody who did not see it. Well, uh, in comparison to the the WWE's uh, last pay-per-view, the Royal Rumble, this is a completely different uh, creature. It's a different beast. Uh, with Royal Rumble, obviously you had the, the two Royal Rumbles, the men's and the women's, but you also have a lot more, it, you can tell there's a lot more script to it. Mm-hmm. There's a, more of a, a drama-esque feel to it. However, with NXT, they got right down to the pain and gain. And uh, they, they showcase their uh, uh, their athleticism over the dramatic aspect that WWE excels at. So it's a different creature, but I would recommend this for anybody who who wants to watch some uh, some good wrestling. Yeah, I'm right there in agreement with you. I thought top to bottom is a good. It was a good, and I'll use this term wrestling card. Um, there was some Gaga in there, absolutely. There was some sports entertainment, if you will, but there was a lot of wrestling. If that's what you like, or if that's what you grew up liking, you're going to find that, I think, with uh, this premium live event is technically the term for it. So I'm going to agree with you, Earl. So let's go ahead and get started. And for those who are are listening or watching this and may not know much about NXT, it is the developmental brand of WWE uh, dating back to uh, the mid to late 2000s. They had what was called FCW, which was Florida Championship Wrestling, which was a territory for for the Earl and I when we were growing up. And so to kind of cultivate that lineage, if you will, that's what they called their developmental territory, brought back some of the uh, the older Florida stars to kind of every once in a while sprinkle them in as a commissioner or as a special guest kind of thing, which is really cool. Or even a referee. Well, yeah. And out of that grew uh, NXT. It originally was on uh, the Sci-Fi Network. Um, at one time ECW was, and then it became NXT, and they sort of did the developmental on the national stage, while really, truthfully, the developmental was down in Florida at FCW, but they would rebrand that NXT, um, and that's been the branding for about uh, 11, 12 years now is what it's been, and so, as the Earl said, it's kind of been the the wrestling show, uh, the wrestling territory really learning the foundation and really learning the basics. And as people get called up to the main roster with varying levels of degree, they've had to replenish their talent. And that's kind of where they are right now. And so we'll talk a little more about that as we go through. But let's go ahead and just start getting into some of the matches that we saw. Well, they were in Charlotte, North Carolina. And as they said several times during the night, the hometown or the adopted hometown, I should say, of the Nature Boy, Rick Flair, and obviously of his daughter, Charlotte Flair, So there was that tie-in. Charlotte's been a hotbed for wrestling for, you know, 60 years, you know, dating back to the 50s and 60s um, when the local territory for the Carolinas was run out of Charlotte. Um, Actually, the owner of the territory at the time would do business at a local restaurant in Charlotte. I mean, it was a very family-run business, so they've always had wrestling there. And you see, through the years, you had Ric Flair, Dusty Rhodes, uh, the Rock and Roll Express, Midnight Express, the Road Warriors, Magnum TA, um, all the way into its modern incarnation with WCW, with, with Sting and Lex Luger and the Steiner Brothers. And that Steiner name is going to come into play uh, here in just a little bit. And eventually, of course, being bought out by WWE. But WWE has still run Charlotte um, at least once a year uh, since they bought WCW. So kind of a homecoming of sorts uh, for wrestling. A good crowd um, on hand for this and I I was really surprised they went with the uh, the match they started with but man what a match to start Wesley versus Dijak do you want to jump in and talk a little bit about that 
Well, uh, to start off with, you have to, uh, when you look at him, and it was billed as a little bit of a David versus Goliath. Mm -hmm. Now, what is 5'10 and about 190 pounds, while uh, his uh, uh, DJ, uh, his opponent is listed as 6'7 and 270 pounds. So right off the bat, you see a, a significant size difference, not just in height, but also in weight and uh, uh, build in general. And these are, this is one of the things we talked about uh, our last one uh, with the Royal Rumble is that we enjoyed the Rumble because you got two different sizes, two groups of people that All right, we had a bit of an internet issue, but we are back. Earl, you were talking about the size differences in the Rumble and how much we enjoyed that. Uh, yes, so the Rumble, one of the reasons we enjoy that is you get two different classes of wrestlers, size differences that would never meet. Mm -hmm. And uh, tonight, I guess I should say, in NXT between DJ and Lee West, you got exactly that. Now, for me, when I saw it originally, I'm like, mm, this is going to be kind of one-sided here. You've got a quicker, more high-flying, uh, athletic type of a runner-style build versus a heavyweight who's going to just be uh, crush him, crush him. And boy, was I wrong. I mean, we did get some crushing. We did get some high-flying, but it wasn't just from one side or the other. And one of the things that I liked was as we were watching it, we, I was like the audience that was there. The audience started off kind of slow, yeah. but as the match progressed and the, it showed that these two these two athletes were willing and able to put on a show and the stamina of these guys, I mean, that was go, go, go. And I have to give them mad props. And there were some crazy bumps. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with that term, that means uh, when you take a, a big hit, and in real life, it's still going to hurt. Mm -hmm. That's what we saw. We saw them putting their body on the line. And because uh, even when you hit that mat, you have to understand that's plywood under there. Right. That's that's like being suplexed in a trailer. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, that's like being you know clothesline and hit the ground in a trailer. It's not going to feel good. It may not be as bad as concrete, but you know what? Drop me on my head a few times in a trailer, and I'm not too happy. We may have done that a few times in our youth back in the day. It could, could be part of the problem. <laughs> it, 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 he could be telling something that is true, but I'm not going to give it either way. But it might be true, yeah. Well, you know, it's, so, that's why it's always amazing to me how they pop right back up. Oh, yeah. Because, because that hurts. And imagine doing this, you know, three, four, five, six, or back in the day, they would do it six seven or eight times a week sometimes double shots on sundays or double yep. shots on Sa i cannot imagine what your body goes through and these guys laid it all on the line and, and honestly i was very surprised that that style was what led off the show because honestly after this it was going to be extremely difficult for any match to touch what they did um, as you said, it was very much David versus Goliath. They played that up well. And like you said, the crowd was a little little slow to react, but by about halfway through the match, they were invested. Oh. Um, oh, yeah. and, and for Dijak, who had who has been in NXT before, kind of redebuted about uh, six months ago, doing this gimmick where you know he's meeting out his own brand of justice, so to speak. That was not his original character uh, when he was brought into NXT. Um, he was Donovan Dijakovic at one time. Then they they shortened it to uh, to Dijak. Um, again, no first names in WWE, but um, so a little bit different what he's doing now. By the way, spray tan, pretty solid. That was very that was very Cheeto orange esque. By the way, it was a T-ball full time as well. Mm. So you look at that and you go, wow, that that looked like a bit of a mismatch. But that's kind of the beauty of NXT is wrestling at its core is suspending your disbelief. And obviously looking at the two competitors, you have to suspend your disbelief at some point because logically once Dijak got a hold of Lee, that would pretty much be the end of it. But I felt like they worked a match that was logical and believable. Yeah. 
And we use a term called false finishes. That's when they go for a pinfall one, two, and the other person kicks out. And, and, and you'll notice when they go to do that, the referee one, two, and they're trained to swipe their hand back up so that it doesn't actually come straight down. Uh, yeah, they, they swipe it back. But when they started having a bunch of those, we are like, wow, he got up from that. I'm like, man, they're setting the bar super high that everybody yeah. else is going to be struggling to have to meet. And uh, I, I thought it was a really good match. The By the way, there was a sequence towards the end, and I, I realized where it happened going back and watching the replay, where um, – Lee had uh went up, jumped, and he did a hurricane rana on oh. die jack, but he didn't he didn't get the full rotation. And so it kind of looked like on the screen that he spiked his head right into the mat. That's die jack was he took the move. But if you go back and watch the replay and look real close when he when he went to do that, he tried to land his hand to kind of stabilize him. And that's when he broke one of the fingers on his left hand. Because if you notice it into the match when the camera appeared back. His, yes, exactly. His hand was up. In fact, it was up during the pinfall because he, you know, he was he was smart. He was trying to protect himself. But dude, that's a bad man who breaks a finger and still continues the match. Didn't complain. You know, I'd have been laying on the mat. You know, they'd have thrown up the X, which usually means somebody's been legitimately hurt. I'd have had him throw up the X just at that thought, much less actually having done it. So hats off to Dijak for being a tougher man than I'll ever be. Hats off to him. Hats off to uh, to Wesley for what I thought was a really hard hitting match, but a really good match, and it really it, it it showed a lot of athleticism. I think on the part of both competitors, but also sure. really for a lot of people who hadn't seen this before, and you could tell in the crowd some of the folk I don't think really knew everybody. Um, yeah. But I think for that that was kind of a good uh, kind of a good baptism or introduction of hey, this is what NXT has the ability to be. And so I thought it was a really, really good match. Um, that that uh, handspring Pele kick, which <laughs> it, which was the finish, looked absolutely nasty. Um, I, I would have been pinned as well, um, but that's just me. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm not surprised that's what took place. Um, the pace the the pace of the match reminded me of I think it was World War Three when you had like Kidman versus uh, Billy Kidman versus uh, I think it was Hugo Guerrero and mm -hmm. I think it was the third one maybe in there but I mean it was a this match wasn't like a, a traditional match where mm -hmm. it slowed down and then it sped up a little bit then it slowed down sped up this match was pretty. For the majority of it, it was quickly paced. I mean, the, the stamina on these guys, I, I cannot stress how much. I mean, you're like, oh, okay, you know, 17 minutes isn't that much. But when you're running and then you're powerlifting, then you're doing up-downs and suicides, that's what the essence of what they're doing is. And, right. again, you know, the thing that really got me was how they, how well they worked together because you had uh, Dijak taking bumps that somebody – a foot shorter and a hundred pounds less should be taken. Her right, exactly. and Rana, all the you know bumps off the the turnbuckles and all these. And we don't want to spoil it for you, but you know he was he was taking bumps and performing moves that somebody a cruiserweight, which was a smaller what Lee is would be probably classified as was right. doing. But then on the other hand, you had Lee taking some massive bumps that traditionally would be taken by somebody of equal size to Dijak. You know, mm -hmm. he was taking these massive boot that, you know, I, he took that boot and I was like, nope, I'm done. He's pinned and he kicks out. And I was like, what? Right. I'm dead. I saw that. And I'm like, my body's hurting here just watching that. So, you know, they, they met and they, they, they did very well. So, you know, and you know, by the end of the match, when the pinfall finally hit, that crowd was on their feet and cheering. And, you know, mm -hmm. at home, I was up too. So, on the one hand, I'm like, why do you start off with that match? But then I'm like, you just got the entire audience invested now. Right. So you know what? I think it was a good plan because I was invested at home. I'm like, well, I don't see how they're going to top this, but let's see if they do. So no. I didn't turn away. If you're going to get people to stay with you, you got to give them something right out of the gate. That's what they did. It, a very interesting sequence at the end of the match where Wesley was sat in one of the announcer's chairs. And uh, Dijak slid a broom between the handles of the chair. 
kind oh. kind of hold uh, Lee there. And out of the crowd came uh, Tony D'Angelo and another fella out and actually rolled the chair out of the way to get the guy out of the way. And um, okay. I think it went to the top ropes intending. Right. And I'll let you finish what happened. Yeah, no, he did a moonsault um, off the top rope to the outside, to the floor, uh, kind of split Tony D'Angelo and the other guy. He got under as best they could. You always worry about somebody getting hurt on something like that because you can't see – where you're flipping, you're hoping you you land somewhere near where the bodies are. So that was that was that was some kind of visual seeing a guy that big uh, for die jack size trying yeah, to somebody, trying to move like that. Closer to three hundred pounds and mm-hmm. two hundred pounds, and he he's doing a moonsault right. from the top of the ring outside of the ring, and then his legs slap that that mat all over that concrete. And I'm like, after seeing that, I'm like, and then he gets up, and I'm like, nope, I'd be laying there going, wheelchair stretcher. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm working off the assumption I could actually push off of that top rope and actually do a full rotation. I'd just push off and be like splat, you know, Wiley Cody style, uh, minus, minus any Acme products. I wouldn't need them. I'd just go straight down. It's embarrassing. You don't have to, you don't have to gimmick or booby trap it. I'm done athletically. Yeah. Why is that top turnbuckle from from the ground? Um, it's probably let's see, uh, Die Jack was probably to his sh- uh, probably a little beneath his shoulder, so it's about six feet tall. Six feet tall, because I'm like, you have to think you're doing a you're doing a backflip like we do at the lake, mm-hmm. except you're backflipping and you're landing from your feet six feet lower, and mm-hmm. there's that mat, but under that mat is concrete, right? Yeah, because like that, that that's the basketball arena yeah, that that, the, really, that they play in. Yeah, I don't want to do a backflip onto a little water because you know when your belly hits that water from the force, it don't feel good. And now imagine going mm-hmm. six feet lower than that, and you know almost missing two guys and hitting that concrete, and then getting back up and continuing. Mm-hmm. Uh-uh. No, so thank you. <laughs> it, it's probably about twelve feet if you're standing on the top rope. So you got the six feet of the ring rope or the of the turnbuckle, plus another five or six foot step down to the floor. So you're you're probably looking at you know somewhere between ten and twelve feet, give or take. And uh, that's just scary as you launch yourself backwards without being able to see where you're going. So very impressive. Now, Earl, you remember back in the day. Uh, you know, we we would have heard wrestlers say, "Don't ever leave your feet if you're a big man." You know, you don't. You don't sell that, um, but Sid, Sid Justice slash Vicious when he did just uh, oh, oh, it was a big fist off. Uh, I, I don't even, was it the top rope or the second? I second believe rope? I actually think he was coming off. If I remember right, you're talking about the pay per view where he broke his leg. Um, that was yep. a that was it was supposed to be like a second rope double axe handle or something, and don't. You don't Google it. You don't want to see it. But we'll just no. tell you, you wear, you wear lace-up boots mm-hmm. on this that go up to the knee. Right. And you have two bones in your in your uh, lower leg, the fibia and tibia. And he broke both of them. And at, from the viewers at home and in the audience, uh, you don't have to guess. Maybe he broke his leg. He broke his leg and you know it. And that was just off of the turnbuckle. And, uh, right. you know, so... Dijak is a little bit smaller than Justice was, but than Sid was, but he was doing a moonshot outside. And so that, that gives you an idea of how dangerous this sport is sports entertainment, but it is a sport and there yeah. is danger involved. And I ain't leaving the mat. I'm not getting on the first term buckle. <laughs> and, and the level of athleticism that these men and women possess versus yeah. what we were watching, you know, me 35 years ago. They were still athletic. Please don't misunderstand me, but they were not doing the type of movements that they're doing today. And so sometimes people get upset, Earl, because they're like, well, they don't lay there and sell it long enough. Well, I get that, right? You don't sell like you've truly been hurt. And, you know, that's part of the story, part of the deal. Um, but, you know, when you have athletes that are that are just machines, um, yeah, they, they have a motor that just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. And so... I really felt like it was a really good match. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, on top of that, you know, if you want them to sell it more, you're not going to be happy because they're going to be like, why is it, you know, he's been laying there for 15 seconds. He needs to get up. That's right. not real. If you want real, 
you can lay there for two and a half minutes trying to get his breath and making sure he's alive. But this is sports entertainment and the, the you have to keep the audience involved. So if you want to suspend your disbelief, you have to watch these these crazy athletes, both men and women, performing for us, the audience, or they can be more realistic and after every crazy move, lay there for two minutes and catching their wind because what they just did was crazy by any normal definition. But right. they're doing this. They're laying things on the line for us. And they're bouncing back up because we have short attention spans now. So, mm -hmm. Well, so. no, you're, you're absolutely right. But again, a really hard-hitting match, but a really great match at the same time. Uh, I thought a really good start. Uh, to the Vengeance Day uh, presentation. All right, from there, um, and by the way, this was not a cool-down segment. This was, uh, I thought, a, a very good match. This was for the NXT Women's uh, Tag Team Championships. Uh, you had Kiana James and Fallon Henley were challenging uh, for those tag championships um, as they took on uh, Katana Chance and Caden Carter um, in the Women's Tag Team yep. title match. Uh, Earl, I don't know how you're familiar, how familiar you are, I should say, with either team. But uh, what did you think of this particular match? Well, uh, initially, I was like, oh, okay, it's a slowdown because any match that took place after that first one can be a slowdown. But the plus side with a tag team match is you can keep uh, fresh people in, mm -hmm. and of course, there's a certain when there's a tag team match, you you have. You know, either the good guys or the bad guys are going to beat on the one person for a little bit. Right. But uh, I mean, the fact that I wasn't familiar with either either team because this is my first foray uh, period into mm -hmm. the NXT, whereas with WWE, it was a return, I'll be a two-decade return. NXT, I'm like, mm, I have no idea who these people are. So I was, while I was watching this, I was gauging how well they moved, how well they worked. And uh, you know what? I wasn't uh, disappointed. They, they, they worked pretty well. Uh, they took bumps. They were, uh, they followed the, uh, the guidelines of a tag team match. So I wasn't uh, hugely surprised, but I was uh, impressed for uh, the NXT brand to have a, 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 a decent tag team match that I wasn't expecting because they're not the top, they're not the premier brand mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, SmackDown. but you know what? Well, the second match, they were still proving to me that they have some, they have athleticism. They have, uh, they have athletes that are willing to, uh, to invest in their trade. What about you? What, what would you say about the second match? Uh, so, you know, we grew up in a time where, you know, there was women's wrestling um, and then you move into to the attitude era and then there was some women wrestling women's wrestling uh, a lot of it was well let's say it doesn't hold up particularly well in 2023 there was a lot of eye candy there may have been a gravy bowl match at one point or several times lingerie pillow fights you know all that stuff um yeah that's not wrestling that's really a, a very very sad outlook on what a, a what a lady, what a woman can actually do in the ring. Um, in the mid two thousands, you saw you had Trish Stratus though, um, you had Victoria, Mickey James, who's still wrestling by the way in Impact Wrestling. We were talking before we came on the air. Uh, she's the uh, Impact uh, Women's Champion. Um, gosh, yeah, you, yep. You had you had Lita, you had Victoria, <clears throat> um, you had all those different performers, Beth Phoenix. Um, who really redefined wrestling as far on the American side. Japan's always had a very strong uh, women's right. wrestling scene. And then for a while there, it really did go um, magazine model type wrestlers. And a lot of those ladies who they hired for that really did like wrestling and really put in the effort to try and get better. But we've really seen a resurgence in women's wrestling in the United States, mainly you know because WWE is the dominant brand. I feel like because of NXT, because you have Charlotte Flair who got her start there, Bailey, yeah. Sasha Banks, Becky Lynch, um, Rhea Ripley, uh, who just won the Royal Rumble. All of those individuals, and and there's there's some I'm forgetting as well. Uh, Sonya Deville, uh, Mandy Rose, um, Aaliyah, who is on the SmackDown brand. There's so many different women that have come through NXT, and so 
I have a special place in my heart for for uh, the women's NXT division because they've always grown some really tremendous homegrown talent. Nia Jax, who appeared in the Rumble uh, last yeah. week, is another NXT uh, 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 call up trainee. So I was excited to see it. I don't treat it as a cool down. I, I respect what these ladies, these athletes do. And I thought it was a pretty good match. The tag champs worked really nice in tandem. I like double team moves in a tag team because if you are a team, you should look like you kind of know what the other person's doing. And that's what the tag champs did. So I really appreciated that. Um, they did a really good job um, carrying the match. Yeah, and, and carrying the match as far as the team. Um, I don't know if you if you saw Josh Woods outside the ring. Uh, it was him, and I forget the other fellow's name, but their facial reactions. I don't know if you were if you saw much of that, or to hear their comments from outside the ring were cracking me up. Because Perfect. if you're gonna, if you're going to be at ringside, sell it. And yeah, I thought their facial, yeah, their facials were good. Their comments were good, and I thought the ladies' facials uh, were really, really good as well. Um, however. In the end, um, unfortunately, if you put money on the tag champs, you're going to have to walk away disappointed. Uh, because in the end, Keanu James and Fallon Henley took down the longest reigning NXT tag team champions and actually walked out brand new champions. Um, uh, Fallon Henley was rolling up Caden Carter. She had uh, kind of put her legs on her shoulders and was kind of holding her down for a pin from outside the ring. Uh, James is holding down Carter's feet, right? So she couldn't kick out of the one, two, three. Referee never saw it. Boom. Brand new NXT Women's Tag Team Champions. Anything else you want to, to posit on this? They had a nice little promo afterwards, too. It was like, oh, this is nice and funny and goofy at the same time. So, you know, they tied in pretty well. Again, there's a place for that. The Gaga, as they call it. it, it has a place even in serious wrestling because you know what? Everybody, I don't care who you are, it's just a little bit off and just a little bit different. And so to get to, to flesh out those personalities and hopefully grow into a time where they can be called up to the main roster, um, very, very good. So so good on them for winning the Tag Team Championships. Um I'm going to use terms that I know uh, some people don't like, but they, they won the belts. I know belts hold up pants, but they are still the tag team belts. So good on them for winning the championship. All right. Next up on the card, we had an interesting match with an interesting stipulation. We had Apollo Crews coming back from the main roster, taking on Carmelo Hayes. Melo equals money. I don't know if you saw that and, and heard that or not, but – He's definitely one of the young lions of NXT. Uh, he's in great shape. I love his character. Um, who uh, He had his manager outside the ring, uh, Trick Williams, who I thought was pretty good oh. in his role. And they aired a very interesting uh, video package before they, before they did this. And it was Apollo Crews talking about his time in NXT and on the main roster and there was, at the very beginning, his debut, and that goes back to 2015 uh, in Brooklyn, all right, in August. I was actually in the crowd at Brooklyn. That was the first NXT TakeOver event. Um, at, at that time, I was on a, another podcast, another radio show, and I actually uh, bought a ticket on StubHub, caught a cheap flight, and flew up there um, on a Saturday morning to see that show on Saturday night in Brooklyn and then fly home. Saturday night. So it was a whirlwind trip. I was there like 24 hours and it was a whole lot of fun. I got to meet some really wonderful people and, and watch the pay-per-view in the arena. It was brand new at the time. Um, so when that happened, dude, I had I had like some feels because I'm like, I was there the night Apollo Crews debuted. Now he'd already been wrestling as Uha Nation previous to that, but he had been signed to the NXT brand. And uh he actually wrestled the perfect 10 Ty Dillinger, who is now Sean Spears. Um, in AEW and uh, Ring of Honor, but so that was his opponent that he went over. And you saw that that standing moonsault he did in the package. That was mm -hmm. that was uh, that he he debuted that. It was it was just really awesome. And so I I know where he's coming from. And I saw him in NXT, and then the Monday the uh, Monday after WrestleMania, because that's usually when they call people up and they change things up. 
he was one of the ones called up uh really the next year if i remember right, i believe it was the next year and uh good looking dude can talk can go uh he's marketable and they yeah. just never really did anything with him yes he won the united states championship yes he he left wrestlemania as the intercontinental champion i was very happy about that but i'd like to say he's been yo-yoed in his career but i'm not sure that he's he's ever even been given that level of success so watching that video was was a reminder of how good he can be um yeah. looking at the matches he had in nxt with finn balor who was holding the nxt championship uh in in one of the parts of that video and then i really liked the little thing in the barbershop <laughs> I, I don't know why but i, I was having barbershop feels right um yeah. having that having that back and forth with mellow and they were both really really good on the mic fun. they were and they both spoke believably um and i i liked um i liked apollo cruz's uh the past is a predictor of the future i thought that was a great line to close that um he comes out to kind of a hero's welcome again he's a he's a main roster guy and so the crowd knew who apollo cruz was and he got a really good reaction uh coming yeah. out carmelo hayes came out with trick williams Okay, reaction. Obviously, he was going to be the heel. And the stipulation for the match was instead of just having one pinfall, one submission, or disqualification, right? Um, in this yep. match, you had to have two pinfalls or two submissions. So the first uh, competitor to score two pinfalls or two submissions or some combination of would yep. be declared the winner. So it's a two out of three falls match. And my expectation going to this was all right, uh, babyface wins the first, or uh, heel wins the first, babyface wins the second, and then, you know, babyface probably wins the third, and they continue the feud on until the next event. That That's my thought. But Earl, give us a little bit about your thoughts and what you saw happen in this match. Well, uh, I watched uh, the build-up to it, and uh, my son was in the room with me, and uh, I was like, all right, let's make a bet. I bet you... Carmelo Hayes is going to get a pin. One, two, three. And uh, if I win, you have to do my chores tomorrow. If you win, I'll actually do your chores tomorrow. However, I cheated. I didn't tell him it was a two out of three pin so that there was <laughs> that I knew he was going to get a victory. How <laughs> However, you know, Carmelo Hayes locked in. What was that? The... Uh, uh, the cross, the, the cross face. face, yeah. And so he got the submission. Submissions didn't count. So at that point, I started getting nervous because I'm like, okay, Cruz is going to win the next one. And uh, then, you know, but as the match had got to that point, I'm like, I think I'm still safe because I had a feeling it, it felt like they were pushed because Cruz was taking some bumps. Cruz was missing some hits. And, uh, you know, Cruz would build up the crowd in order for Carmelo just to to, to chop him down a notch. And I'm like, we, we've watched enough wrestling in our time where we know when the, somebody's getting, you know, somebody's going to get jobbed. And again, that's a wrestling term. I haven't used it in the Lord knows in a long time. We're like, I'm like, I get the feeling I'm still safe with my, with my, uh, my bet. And so as it progressed, and again, both of them, uh, very good athletes, both of them took, some decent bumps, but I really enjoy. I started to really like Carmelo Hayes as the uh, the, the villain, as the heel, uh, because his interactions with his uh, manager out there, who who whose mannerisms was hilarious. You know, watching from the the apron. No, 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 no. You know, it, it just it helps to sell the whole uh, the gimmick uh, very well. So I was I was getting to the point where. I mean, honestly, I tend to root for the heels sometimes, you know. Just No, I, not I, you. No, that never happens. It's in my contract, okay? I have to. <laughs> you healed so, your son, for goodness sakes. <laughs> so let's just say that, uh, you know, about halfway through the match, after the first uh, uh, submission, I was like, I got this in the bag. And mm -hmm. I can, because I can see it coming. Uh, what about you? Did you have any kind of a uh, foresight? That it that it might happen. I was still expecting, though, for a cruise to get at least, you know, a pinfall or something. But so I was, I was, I was surprised at how quickly they just went. 
So the normal methodology in a two out of three falls match is heel wins the first, baby face wins the second, and then they do a bunch of, of really close calls in that third fall, and uh, then, then, then someone wins it. I had no expectation that Carmelo Hayes was going to take it in two straight, two straight wins, first with a cross face, where, look, be honest, Apollo Crews straight up tapped out. There was no yep. interference. There was no distraction. There was no feet on the ropes. There was no foreign object. It's straight. He locked him in the in the in the cross face, and it, he was in the middle of the ring, and he straight tapped out. And you know what? That's why you need to be healed. You need a manager. You need a partner. You need somebody that's paid to either distract the referee or pull the referee, or when the referee's not looking, you know, peg him in the head with something. Because that's why heels wins a good bit of the time is because we have friends and family to look out for us. So, like so, 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 what? You're part of the uh, Carmelo family now. I hear a lot of we stuff going on here. Maybe. May I have? <laughs> Continue. I, I, I see there was no response there. Um, so when that took place, I'm like, well, uh, uh, Apollo's going to catch the next one. Maybe a quick one. Um, normally they uh they uh, give a few seconds between the end of a fall and the start of the the next fall. They did not do that. It just carried on. Thought that was nice uh, touch. Um, and then when uh when Hayes got in there and uh, hit that leg drop off the top, um, that I was just like, holy! Because when he hit it, I'm like, I know that's his finish. And uh, sure enough, he yeah. pinned him clean in the middle of the ring. Now, right before that, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um. Trick Williams kept threatening to interfere with the chair, right? And during that second fall. No, I did not see that. And of you course, you, of course, it's literally like having Bobby Heenan. It's like it's like resurrecting Bobby Heenan. Um, but but uh, you're, you're a liar. Okay. So uh Dabacado came out, uh, who previously was uh Commander Aziz, I believe, and uh showed up to help prevent um trick williams from interfering it did not matter because um apollo cruz was like you know fist bumping him or shaking his hand or whatever turned around and literally within 45 seconds to a minute was laying on his back um for the one two three so i thought that would felt odd um and then of course uh daba gets in the ring and attacks apollo cruz I'm going to say this. Make no mistake. They booked this intentionally. They had this play out the way it did intentionally because I expect Carmelo Hayes to be challenging for the NXT championship um, at their next event, which is going to be WrestleMania weekend. An early uh, tip, by the way, like one o'clock in the afternoon, if I saw correctly, uh, when they were advertising it. I think you're going to see him uh, challenging for the belt. Um, either the North American title held by Wesley or for the NXT championship. When I would expect it would be the NXT championship because that's what they were hyping up. So I thought it was a good match. I thought it was very one-sided and I think that was extremely intentional so that you're preparing the fan base to accept him as the next contender uh, for whomever would walk out of um, the steel cage at the end um, uh, to be the next challenger. I will say this. Um, I thought, uh, you know, I don't know if you noticed Apollo Crews wearing the red contact lenses. Um, yeah, I actually thought I think they're, they're cool. Maybe not everybody does. Um, I liked I mean, um, uh, Carmela's uh, his Titan Tron when uh, Trick Williams stood there and, and read off all of his accomplishments and they brought him down. Well, no, it, it's like going to a basketball game and seeing all the banners hanging in the rafters of championships, playoff appearances, conference titles, whatever it is. That's that's really super flipping cool. Um but I will say I will say this. Well, two things I'll say on this. One, when they finally call up Carmelo Hayes, if they don't bring Trick Williams with him, that's gonna be oh, yeah. a huge loss because that is money, no pun intended. The two together. I don't yeah. need to see Trick wrestle unless it's like one of those things where somebody gets hold of the manager kind of deals for like five minutes or something like that. Yeah. But the gimmick is good and I enjoyed it. And that leads me to the last thing I wanted to say about Apollo Cruz. I'll hand it back to you. Uh, he said it in that interview and it was scripted, but he said, I left too early. 
He specifically said that. And I, I made a note of that on my phone to bring it up tonight. <clears throat> That's exactly how it felt. He left NXT when there was still a lot to do. There was still a lot of potential in him and still a lot that uh, they could they could utilize him to really build the brand and, and by extension, build his own personal brand. And so, you know, we've seen NXT wrestlers go to the roster, main roster, and either fail miserably. Um, for example, um, Adam Rose, who you will not know, but he basically had a party bus and he partied all the time. And that was his gimmick. And in NXT, it was a wonderful gimmick. It was just so weird and random. And he'd have like a group of about 12 people follow him to the ring and they would dance and he would wrestle and whatever, right? When he gets to the main roster, he goes from 12 people to 30 people following him. One of them is in a bunny costume. Everybody's dressed up in weird things. It's weird. And they just debuted it. They debuted it with a couple of uh, uh, some vignettes and then all of a sudden he shows up. And then the announcers are trying to do the dance in conjunction with what he's doing you know what if i'm your person trying to get that over doing that the fan base is going to revolt as they should and that's exactly what happened he was on borrowed time he was there for probably a year but he flamed out quickly then became a heel that nobody really was interested in that's a shame he's never come back to wrestling he has a a real job in the real world not wrestling um, so there, there have been a lot of those call ups and then flame outs because they didn't know what to do, or maybe the writers for the main roster didn't understand what made these characters special in NXT because that's the smaller pond or whatever, and they kind of got pushed to the side. We've seen that with some of the women, even in some cases. So <clears throat> hopefully, this is a chance for Apollo Crews to, uh, I'm not gonna say take time off because you will bust your hump in NXT. It's not like doing a three minute or a five minute SmackDown match. You got to go because the people are expecting it. But hopefully, good on him to get that second chance to kind of maybe write a little bit different story. But that was not to be tonight as he was thoroughly dominated. And then to add insult to injury or injury to insult, depending on how you look at it, he gets turned on by the guy who supposedly came out to help him. So, Earl, finish us up here on Apollo Cruz and Carmelo Hayes. Well, the follow with what you were saying. Uh... Uh, it sometimes it takes a while for uh, you to to find your feet because if you remember uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin, uh, we remember him originally as Stunning Steve Austin That's because true. he had uh, yeah. hair and it was blonde and it was stunning in in a way. <laughs> in a way, yes. <laughs> then he became the ringmaster for a, a period of time. Uh, mm-hmm. No, he the circus we're not totally but i mean so you see there's a progression sometimes it take a while like uh we could say there's isaac yankum dds yeah and then two and then eventually he became kane and everybody mm-hmm. knows kane mm-hmm. then you have rocky maya via who was originally supposed to be a baby face but, but the audience hated him and so he went away for a little bit and then he came back as nation of domination and he was the rock so sometimes it takes a while to get your footing find your niche and find a uh, find the right spot sometimes it's hard to find it sometimes you fall into it now as for the, uh, the apollo cruise you know i'm glad you brought it up because the, especially the, the red eyes and i figured it out um all of you who are thinking that apollo cruise was the face are greatly mistaken you see apollo cruise actually had pink eye in both eyes so badly that they were red and that uh, Dabakato was upset because his friend infected him. So he came out very upset. So when you think that Carmelo is the villain here, that's not the case. It's Apollo Crews the villain with his uh, unsanitary uh, hygiene that gave himself and his friend Pink Eye. So from the bottom of my heart, I'm here for you, Carmelo. And Mr. Apollo Crews, you need to get that checked out. And Dabakato, I understand your rage and your anger. And... Uh, I will say a prayer for you. <laughs> it was literally like listening to Vince Russo try to explain some of his booking ideas. Literally. <laughs> I <laughs> I got hit in the big I got hit in the face with a big bag of stupid and the, the bag seems to have seems to have burst open upon impact. So we're gonna move on, you sick, <laughs> sick individual. 
All right. Up next, we had the NXT Tag Team Championship, what was a fatal four-way. Now, they specifically went out on limb to say there was uh, no disqualification, which meant to me there's going to be a lot of plunder. There's going to be a lot of shenanigans take place because otherwise there's no reason for you to say that. Uh, yeah. the, the four teams involved uh, were pretty deadly. Chase University, Gallus, who had been the NXT UK uh, Tag Team Champions, had a long run with that. And then the reigning and defending NXT Tag Team Champions, Xavier Woods and Kofi Kingston, uh, The New Day. Now, you knew going into this, um, having too many wrestlers in the ring, like in a rumble, is very chaotic and hard to follow. Now you put four teams, eight bodies out there, so there's always a lot to do. Um, I really felt like, just kind of lay a little foundation, I'll hand it off to you. All the teams worked hard to try to make this as entertaining as possible. It, it really felt like um, to do that. Uh, Chase University is freaking fantastic. And I got the biggest kick out of them. And uh, their cheerleader, Thea Hall. Um, we need more of Thea because Thea was dadgum entertaining, uh, yelling and cheering um, for her university. And did you notice? There was a Chase U section in the crowd. I, I really appreciate that. Now listen, when you go to Charlotte, you've got UNC Charlotte. You've got Queens University. There's a bunch of schools there in Charlotte, North Carolina. So to see Chase U represented in Charlotte, hey, I feel like, hey, this is the next dominant collegiate brand waiting to spawn on the national level. Earl, how did you feel about this match? You know, it has been a long time since I've seen a, a match like this. And the last time I've seen these hardcore matches where your anything goes in disqualifications would have been back in the day when they were hardcore tag team matches, mm -hmm. usually uh, the belts were on a belt and it was like a TLC match or something like that. Table ladder series for those who. Right. Don't know. So um, I was a little thrown off. I don't know if I don't, I just don't remember it, but when you have four teams wrestling, I thought that there used to be four people in wrestling simultaneously, but with them only having two people in and then six people on the outer apron, is that how they used to do it? Or, or was this a. No, that's how they, that's how they used to do it. Yeah. When they had this many teams. Yeah. I don't remember that at all. So when, uh, when it came in, I was like, okay, this is different. Uh, maybe I just don't remember it, but uh, the chaos was kept to a, a minimum initially, of course, Sure. Uh, because of it. and uh, I enjoyed the fact that because of uh, the way they operated, where well, you could reach out and tag somebody and then hop in, that it was very quick paced. Uh, you know, they beat up on one of the uh, the pretty deadly for a little bit at the beginning, which I understand. I mean, that gold eyeliner did not go with his complexion at all, so he deserved to get beat a little bit. But I digress. Did you <laughs> did you like their outfits though? You know what? I didn't know if they were. Uh, ice skaters, and or or then when they took it off, I was like, no, they're they're magicians. They're where's the lion that's gonna hop out? I was a little confused. I kind of got the Hardy Boy vibes off of them actually a little bit. Could be, could grow into that if given an opportunity. But you know, it was a. Uh, I, I like that they kept the pace going, so they continued, you know, uh, ramping it up a bit, and then obviously the. The hijinks began to ensue. Now, in, in this match, there's no disqualification, right? Correct. So why not just all jump in at the very beginning? I mean, I know that's not the way it was planned, but if I was there, you know, you know, not as a heel, mind you, I'm there. The rules no, are not, you know, no. Why not just go in swinging chairs? I don't know why they'd be nice in this already. <laughs> Do you wake up trying to find ways to get over on people? No, sometimes I dream about it before I wake up. Oh, but uh, so yeah, I uh, you know, again, I was familiar with a uh, new day with uh, Kofi mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Xavier Woods, and uh, from the Rumble, of course, where sure. it was Kofi who was always doing the uh, the the high jinks, trying not to get right. eliminated. So I was familiar with them, and the, obviously the audience was very familiar with them, cheering them on uh, excessively. And uh, but I did find the Chase University, uh, the, the pre match where they're outside getting ramped up, and the, right. the, uh, you know, Andre Chase and the player, yes, yes, and fantastic. He, and uh, poor uh, Duke Hudson's over there, like, well, it was cold, 
little snowflakes falling. He's there in like a tank top sweater vest or something. He's just like. <laughs> He had to get he had to get excited because he was trying to stay warm. So um, you know, I enjoyed seeing uh, you know that they actually have some uh, uh, promo skills and uh, and getting the the crowd over. But they were also I, I enjoyed the match. Uh, were there any highlights that you liked or didn't care for? Or um, one spot in particular that jumps out at me was teasing going through the announcers table. And then the guy picking up all the stuff and saying the pretty deadly was putting the stuff back on the announcer's table, apologizing and saying sorry. Um, they're, good guys. they're trying to fix what the other guy was trying to mess up. Well, if so, one thing in the middle of this match that kind of threw me off was Booker T and his announcement. We haven't really talked about that yet. And yes, he is the shucky ducky quack quack king. I do understand that, but somewhere along the way during the match, where he had been pretty level on most of the night became a heel color commentator and was ragging on new day, which absolutely makes zero sense. Um, if you're the heel commentator, be the heel commentator. Um, so apparently uh new day was, I guess, glomming everybody's heat uh, by uh, having too many teams in it. Well, I guess they should have just had one beaten them and walked out with the belts. And I guess a uh, book would have been happy. So that was really that was just some weird stuff. I got to tell you right there. Um, there was a spot towards the end of the match where there was a superplex from the top to the outside um, landing on all the competitors. Now, normally that spot would look really, really contrived, but that one looked really natural in the yeah. flow of the story uh, they were telling. Um, you knew. You know, I, I had wondered, you know, would they let New Day retain and then have it go to Mania and maybe take the belts off of them there? Um, but when Kofi Kingston climbed to the top rope and did his his uh, launching himself backwards off onto the floor at that moment, I knew they were not going to they were not going to keep the belts because yeah. Pretty Deadly caught him, uh, put him down uh, with their reverse neckbreaker uh, move on the floor, and that left the. Yeah, and it left Xavier Woods in the ring um, basically by himself. Um, and more often than not in the New Day, he takes the pinfall loss. That's kind of how he's – well, no, I'm just saying that's kind of how his role has been carved out. He's a really good wrestler, I think, a really good performer. But uh, when I saw that, I'm like, well, here we go. And then you saw uh, Gallus uh, take advantage uh, of that um, and hit their yeah. double-team finish. I hear you say Gallus take advantage, and I heard that Kofi, like a chicken, jumped out of the ring so he wouldn't have to face Gallus. So I heard Kofi fled in fear, and uh, his partner valiantly stand up, but Gallus, as you know, a tag team should, work together for the victory. That's what I saw. Okay, you mean literally uh, like the coward he is, right? He was running away from the fight. Okay, well... Uh, okay. I'm, I just, I don't even know what to do with you at this point. Um, <laughs> Gallus hits her double team move and, uh, they score the pin on, uh, Xavier Woods, which is honestly the way it should be in a tag match. If you're going to win the tag belt, you ought to pin the person who actually has the belt, which has always been one of my issues with multiple team matches or multiple person matches, triple threats or whatever, you know, the champion should be the one who loses otherwise i don't really feel like but that's just more of a personal thing because i'm old and grumpy and want people to get off of my lawn but i thought it was a good match one other thing to point out that i put a note here during the introductions by far new day had the best reaction because again they're known uh, and their popularity uh, remains very high so they only had it what maybe a month reign a couple of weeks as nxc champions but uh good you know, I, I heard uh, Vic Joseph try to sell it, talking about they had traveled to Australia, they had traveled here, they traveled to Los Angeles, and they were carrying the NXT uh, tag team division on their back. And I'm like, first dude, time, it's been three weeks, dude. So, but I get it, I get it. You got to sell it as hard as you can. But I was like, oh, that's that's excessively selling. But anyway, Gallus emerges as your new NXT World Tag Team Champion. So. We've had three title matches on the show, two yep. title two title changes, back-to-back -back title changes. 
Would that be three consecutive title changes? And we go into our next match, which was the women's NXT championship, uh, championship, excuse me, uh, being held by Roxanne Perez, Roxy Perez, if you will. She was in the Royal Rumble uh, last weekend. She didn't last a super long time. She didn't uh, do anything super noteworthy, but she was in it. It's her home state. Uh, a Texas, you know, it was in San Antonio. And so she got to go be a part of that and wrestle for a few minutes in front of a massive crowd. So good for her. She gets to to build her brand a little bit and by extension, the NXT brand as well. But she found herself in quite the pickle. Uh, they had an over the top rope battle royal elimination where if you're tossed over the top rope, always remember kids, both feet must touch the floor. And in what looked to be a little bit of creative splicing, I don't know. I was not there. Um, but the end of the Battle Royal came down to two participants. Um, and if I remember, it was a toxic attraction. It was both of them. Um, Jane and Dolan is is who it is. Um, you have <coughs> Gigi Dolan and JC Jane who are who are toxic attraction. They both uh, were bumped off of the ring and both landed on the floor at the same time, basically making them co-winners of the tag team uh, or the uh, the heavyweight championship, women's championship opportunity. So this became a bit of a three-way dance or a triple threat, if you will, uh, where the first competitor to score a pin or a submission would uh, walk out of the ring as that champion. Um, the odds were definitely stacked against Roxy. Um, it was two on one. I thought it was interesting when they announced Toxic Attraction. You know, normally they have separate entrances, but in this instance, both ladies came down together. It's a small thing, but it's a nice touch because they are a team. They should come out together um, to kind of put in our mind that, hey, you know what? They're going to work together and they're going to eliminate Roxy. And then decide the championship between them. That's not exactly how it turned out. Earl, I'm going to hand it off to you. What did you think of the NXT Women's Championship match? Well, I believe that uh, Roxy gets, uh, you know, uh, Gigi and, and JC as the uh, the tag team toxic attraction. It uh, was listed as a triple threat match. Mm -hmm. And as you said, it was very skewered one way. And I think it's very unfair for... Uh, I think it was very unfair for <clears throat> Toxic Attraction because uh, Roxy could just sit back and let them fight because only one of them could have won the, the, the belt. So Roxy was in the benefit of letting the two challengers fight, knowing that only one of them could win. So it was very unfair to this tag team, forcing them to fight one another in order to win while Roxy just sat back and watched. That was just very unfair, in my opinion, how it was set up. Right. <laughs> Well, wow, you're, you're just going to live the gimmick all night, aren't you? I don't know. But but before I continue, um, I have to say that my uh, my daughter was actually in the room with me watching it. And she was a, a big fan of Roxy. And uh, uh, at the lead up to it, when they were talking about, and then also during Booker T was throwing out some facts, how uh, she started really training. Uh, you know, she was working on boxing and a few other things when she was 13. And by the time she was 16, she was devoted to becoming a wrestler and right. uh, actually he had uh, helped train her son uh, uh, when she was younger. So my daughter gravitated toward that because uh, uh, Roxy, I think is only like 21 or 22. So uh, a younger woman who knew from a younger age that she wanted something. And so she chased her dream and, you know, she attained it. So for my daughter to see that, she, she really enjoyed the backstory. And because of the backstory, she was invested in the match. So, right. I mean, I think uh, very good. Well, one uh, kudos to uh, Carla Gonzalez, who is Roxy uh, Perez, for you know knowing what she wanted and going for it. Because it's very rare these days, or even back when we were, that somebody wanted something and right. wanted it and fought for it and trained for it and worked on it and didn't give up. So I mean, kudos to her. Props. You know, I, I and this isn't sarcasm. You know, props to her. But I also really appreciate it as a father of of a daughter that heard that story and instantly was involved because of that story and was rooting for her. I mean, she was actively rooting for Roxy going, no, do that thing where she 
you know, her finisher move, which was really impressive looking. I mean, initially mm-hmm. it's like, where did she pull her up? And then it's like, bam. And I'm like, oh God, that hurt my chest. Mm-hmm. And then it looked weird. And then when she smacked them down, I forget what it was called, but even the name of it was kind of neat. Um, but I mean, it was an unexpected uh, slam. And I was like, man, that looked, initially looked weird. It looked like some kind of, you know, slow roll up for a pin that ended up being a rather painful looking slam. So yeah, uh, you know, I really enjoyed the fact that my daughter got invested in this because of uh, the true backstory of Mm -hmm. the woman. She she literally was leaned forward watching going, no, no, no. And I was like, hey. So, you know, kudos for that. I I love that a lot. But, you know, I couldn't root for her because she was uh, swaying. She was forcing two almost sisters to fight one another to get a chance at the pin. Right, yeah, then, she she took advantage of the numbers game, didn't she? One on two. She violently, violently launched a woman into a table. Just rude. I mean, what? Why would she do such a thing? You know, that's just that's true villainy, folks. Was when somebody consciously looks and makes a decision to potentially break a young woman. You know, doing what she loves just because she didn't want to risk losing her belt. That's true villainy. Well, there you go, kids. Uh, Gigi Dolan uh, put through the table at ringside unceremoniously and apparently unprovoked, uh, according to the Earl tonight. Uh, Eventually, uh, Roxy uh, was able to get uh, uh, Jane in there and uh, put her away with a code red um, off the turnbuckles was the move that she did to score the pin. And so Roxy retains her NXT Women's Championship. I thought it was a good match and a fun match. Triple threats yeah. are always hard to do because you either have two on one till the very end or someone is left lane while the other two yeah. fight it out for five or ten minutes. So it's always hard to book. I thought this was good. I thought the action stayed pretty consistent. I like the storyline development as well um, between yeah. between the two partners that were – it was sort of an, uh, an uneasy alliance as the match went on. All right. Yeah. Very last match of the card. It is time for the main event. It is Grayson Waller challenging for the NXT Championship against Braun Breaker. Those of you not familiar with Braun Breaker, he's actually the son of a wrestling star and WWE Hall of Famer, uh, Rick Steiner. His uncle is Scott Steiner. Uh, His uh, father and uncle went to WWE Hall of Fame a couple of years ago. And uh, so he is the next generation of Steiner. And he came out for his match, and right off the bat, Waller took it to him. I don't know if you noticed, using the um, uh, the cage door, right, as soon as the match started. Um, I thought Waller had an amazing performance. Uh, really, it looked like he had found a groove um, in what he was doing. But Earl, I'm going to hand it off to you. What did you see in this match that, that really jumped out at you? Well, I saw the unmitigated attack of uh, of uh, Mr. Braun Breaker against Waller using that steel door before they could even get in the cage. That was just just violent and uncalled for. And wait, wouldn't you wouldn't you be cheering on Waller to do that? No, no, no. Uh, that was when a uh, uh, Breaker slammed the door into a uh, Waller. That literally didn't happen. That's what I saw. And uh, then he... he <laughs> his, mo- his monitor is broken at ringside. I see. So, uh, uh, on the rail, though, uh, they started off with a lot of intensity, uh, speed, and a lot of strengths, uh, clotheslines, uh, uh, some knee drops, uh, some being launched into the cage. And anybody who's familiar with cage matches is... It's a different dynamic. Even when, and uh, I, I'm sure you know that when they were bounced off the ring, you know, off the ropes, gaining speed, you heard the smack as they hit that steel, the steel wire behind right. the cage. And that can't be comfortable, you know, whacking into that. You know, it's bad enough hitting those wire, you know, those, the steel wrapped uh, uh, ring ropes, but hitting the cage as well. And, uh, but the, the, the crowd was into it. They were, uh, they were, uh, cheering some, there was some barking, <laughs> and right. I love the 
<laughs> of Waller, uh, of uh, Grace Waller mocking him. Oh, sure. um, and also later on when uh, he was on the mat, and he was on all fours and left his leg. That was just, uh, I giggled a little bit at that. I mean, uh, it's sophomoric, but you know what? We're sophomoric too. It's okay. I mean, you know what? He he was working the crowd. So I mean, he also did a little bit of the Ric Flair strut. I don't mm-hmm. know if you saw that on the side before he made it in. And I'm like, I immediately like this guy. And he had a lot of energy. He he didn't have the, the same amount of muscle mass that uh, uh, Braun had, but he, he had a lot of stamina and energy that I think they worked together pretty well uh, going back and forth on that. Now, uh, there are a few times when I'm pretty sure that uh, Waller got the three count, but the referee, you know, at the last, at, after he counted the three, he was like, oh, wait, no, okay, no. We didn't he waved three. it off, in other words, yeah, okay, all right, sure. Um, it wouldn't be Charlotte, North Carolina, if there weren't a steel cage match, right? Um, so that was a nice homage to uh, wrestling from years past. Um, at the end, um, you can kind of see that both wrestlers, I felt like, were kind of hampered by the cage. Yes. By the closeness of the ropes. I don't think they ever got everything in that they would normally do, and it maybe didn't look as good as it would in a normal ring setup. But still, lots of credit to them for how hard they worked and what they are able to do. I liked Waller just straight up slapping the taste um, at a breaker right before he got speared into oblivion and, and lost the match. But still... Uh, he was defiant all the way to the end, and that's what you want a challenger to be. So, what uh, heroes do. they yeah. never give up, never surrender in the face of villainy. Be brave, be loyal, be true, but have your white flag handy just in case. That is the motto by which we live. Um, in the end, Braun Breaker retains the NXT uh championship by pinfall over Marcus Waller. Uh, as you and as you and, mentioned earlier, foreshadowing of future events. Yes, how how fortuitous of us to be so sharp. Um, our man, Carmelo Hayes, comes out onto the stage um, at the end of the show. I guess kind of indicative of the fact that he's going to be the next challenger for that yeah. NXT championship. Yeah. So the pay-per-view lasted, or the premium live event, I think we're supposed to call it, lasted about two hours and 45 minutes, two hours and 50 yeah. minutes. They ended a little bit early, so... Not nearly the marathon that the Royal Rumble was last week in the four and a half hour extravaganza that was the Rumble. Uh, a whole lot shorter, a whole lot different, but I'm going to argue just as enjoyable, maybe even a little more so because, well, it wasn't as long as the Rumble was. And it kind of exists in its own pocket universe, if you will. Um, every, every once in a while, the NXT brand will crisscross with the others. Um, <clears throat> there was a time. And this is before, this is a couple of years ago, where uh, a lot of the wrestlers got stranded overseas in Europe. Because you remember a few years ago when there was a volcanic eruption and there was all that yep. ash in the air and it grounded plane travel? A bunch, yep. bunch of the wrestlers couldn't get back home. They were stuck over there. And so what they had to do was make an emergency call to Orlando and say, can you get the NXT people here as soon as you can? And they wrote SmackDown that night because they only had like four, five, six wrestlers total from the main roster they brought up all nxt people and basically the nxt people kept attacking the main roster people and basically they set up the survivor series where it was nxt smackdown and raw and honestly nxt won the majority of the bouts it was incredible they put over nxt that strong and then it died off the next day the next week and that that literally was the crescendo of the NXT brand to show how it was just as competitive, if not better. Um, not yeah. to count, not to count the other events they've done on pay-per-view or live events that were getting so much critical praise and uh, adoration, but you know, it's kind of trailed off, it cooled off. Uh, they did some different things. They rebranded, they changed logos. They did a lot of stuff that for a lot of the longtime fans, it didn't resonate. And now they're trying to rebuild that brand. And I think tonight, was a very positive step in that. If you're not watching the NXT show on a weekly basis, check it out. It's on Tuesday nights on USA um, at 8 o'clock. Um, so it's unopposed pretty much for any other wrestling. You have AEW comes on at nine o'clock or 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock on Wednesday nights. But NXT is its own uh, pocket universe. Check it out. 
Um, if you live in the southern region where they do tours sometimes, go out and watch them. It's a good time. It's 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 kid friendly. It's family friendly. They're not going to curse and swear, and they're going to give your family as good as interaction as you will get at a wrestling show. And oftentimes, the wrestlers are there early, signing autographs, going around ringside, um, visiting with everybody. I know that my oldest got to meet Bailey when she was in NXT because we had ringside tickets. I mean, literally, we're talking about ten bucks for ringside tickets, right, in a small venue. And she got yeah. to hold the the women's championship, and all she can talk about to this day, she'll be sixteen is how heavy that belt was because, you know, it doesn't look like it weighs that much until you actually get it. And it's like, wow, it's a real, it, it's a really cool item. So I would encourage you, if you can't make NXT, if you have a local show nearby, you go watch it, go support it. Uh, the more places people have to learn and to work, the better wrestling is as an industry. Earl, I'm going to throw it back to you. Any final comments, anything you want to talk about with tonight's uh, event that we, we just recapped? Well, on the real, um, I was pleasantly surprised, and the the pace that was set at the beginning was fast and hard, and I think part of the reason we enjoyed uh, this pay-per-view as much as uh, the Rumble is because uh, there was kind of no nonsense. They're like, this is our pace, this is where we're going, and so it felt fast and fresh, and, uh, and it was new-ish for you and new for me, and so... It was it was it was very enjoyable because it was uh it was kind of a no frills fun zone and uh, they did showcase some of their their promo skills and everything but they they were very much into uh, showing you that this is wrestling this is the fun of wrestling this is the enjoyability you've got your faces you've got your heels you've got your disqualifications you've got your all these different things going on so you know I really enjoyed it and uh, you know what I would say if uh, you know, we get views and comment and likes that, you know, maybe next month we uh, check out another NXT. Because I know in two weeks uh, there is a uh, there is a elimination chamber that's yep. on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, again, we're wanting to find out if people are wanting us to uh, you know, check in on that. And uh, you know what? We're at the point where I might have to check it out regardless because I am starting to find find the the fun and the love of uh, wrestling once more well as obviously your cousin and lifelong brother I, i'm glad to hear that you're enjoying that because i am as well um elimination chamber i think we will probably do a podcast a review of that but it may just be earl because i have some some family commitments that weekend that are make it darn near impossible uh for me to be able to see it and record we'll we'll have some uh, family things going on that will preclude me from being able to sneak away and watch that on my phone, but Earl could point, certainly. At which point you may have uh, my point of view, and then a rebuttal video. <laughs> I, you know what? I'm I'm fine with doing that. You you know we have we have different opinions on things, but we'll try and get one of those done for sure. We'll come back together uh, for Mania season uh, with yep. Mania itself, which is spread over two days. So you'll probably have two podcasts for that. Plus, you have the NXT show, which would be a third show. So it could be a marathon recording over that weekend. Um, with that, we appreciate you listening. We ask you to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm. But more than that, it's just an encouragement to us. We picked up a bunch of subscribers in the last week, um, a lot more views on our, our, our channel. And we greatly appreciate that. We are growing and we do not take it for granted because you all are making it possible for us to come on here and randomly talk about stuff that apparently not just amuses and interests us, y'all are interested in amused as well. So, like I said, like, share it out to people, leave comments. We'd love to hear what you have to say. We appreciate it. We read every one of them and we will respond to them. So for the Earl of Florida, I am Lord Cephas. We had a great time tonight. We look forward to getting back together on this topic. Uh, in a couple of weeks and then together we'll be back um, for the uh, mania for that weekend in the meantime the midnight magic music channel will continue on we have shows that scheduled all next week we have shorts we have some filler things coming as well so check back often we will have more content for you so again on behalf of the earl of florida i am the lord cephas thank you so much for joining us tonight we greatly appreciate it for uh being on our uh combat one wrestling podcast that's right it is c1 uh, for those, yeah, we, we may just have to use the gimmick, but yes, our Combat One podcast, our review of NXT Vengeance Day.
So on behalf of the Earl, I'm the Lord. We are out. Have a good day. We will see you again soon. Take care.